Hi and welcome to this um, short tutorial on um, student-centered learning. Um, I thought it might be useful to um, look at the, the concept of student-centered learning because it's one of the terms that features in um, the National Forum's uh, professional development framework, particularly, sorry no for scrolling through this, but when we look at the domains and domain four, um, one of the things they talk about here in 4.2 is the support of um, active student-centered approaches. So that notion, student-centered um, learning and student-centered teaching, um, is something that's quite popular. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of talk in the literature about it. Uh, lots of places are trying it, and, and I thought it'd be worth um, exploring this so that you maybe appreciate um what what's meant i guess by student centered learning um so i have two resources that i'm going to use to support this so we have um this one from the university of uh, adelaide which is leap into student centered learning um and here i think i'm mostly interested in the um or initially at least the definition uh, so they talk about student-centered learning, um, describes ways of thinking about learning and teaching that emphasize student responsibility uh, for such activities as planning learning, interacting with teachers and other students, uh, researching and assessing learning. So I think for me what's, I guess, interesting about this is, you know, the shift towards student responsibility. So this is one of the, for me at least, the important ideas in terms of, you know, what is a student-centered approach. And the second thing that interested me was the breadth of um, maybe the expectations so that student, you know, student-centered isn't just about engaging students. You know, it's about students taking responsibility to plan their own learning in certain ways. Uh, it doesn't have to be the entirety of their learning, but that you know, that they take responsibilities for this, that they take responsibility for interacting with teachers and other students, um, that, they, that they take responsibility to research, and, and interestingly as well, that they take some responsibility to um, assess learning. So uh, I think the breadth of um, the expectations is, is interesting. Um, on, on the second page, uh, student-centered teaching or learning is often contrasted with teacher-centered approaches. Uh, and I think, again, it might be in terms of understanding where we're, where we're what the term means, that kind of comparison is useful. So teacher-centered is very much about the transfer of um, knowledge. Uh, sometimes, personally, I wouldn't even use the word knowledge. I think it's often about, it's more about the transfer of information, that knowledge means that, you know, a certain level of understanding and that doesn't always happen. Um, but it's it's really about this notion of coverage of content and, and I would say giving of information. Um, uh, so what you see in teacher-centered approaches is very much, you know, the dominant forms or lectures uh, in terms of the teaching approach and the dominant form of assessment is um, exams. And the reason why those are is because they're um, very appropriate, you know, to transfer and assess information. Lectures are very efficient in that way, uh, and exams are pretty good at assessing routine sort of knowledge and memorization and procedures and things like that. Uh, so that would be often what is characterized as teacher-centered approaches. And then student-centered would be the focus is not on transferring information or indeed transferring knowledge but about understanding concepts kind of repositioning students that they are expected to be able to question and, and problem solve and search for knowledge and, and think for themselves uh, and the rest of this um, um, article pay, uh, report i guess is some interesting things in terms of you know teaching strategies and assessment and things like that but um, I think um, a perhaps more useful um, introduction to student-centered learning is provided um, 
by Geraldine O'Neill and Tim McMahon from University College Dublin. This is um, uh, the All Ireland Society for Higher Education. Uh, so they kind of um, have both a journal and organize a conference, and this would have been um, one of the conferences, so a publication one of the, the conferences. Um, I'll, I'll come back to this first page. They contrast teacher-centered learning and student-centered learning on, on three different dimensions. The idea of student choice that in teacher-centered approaches, students have very little choices. So, you know, they can come to class or not come to class. They don't have any choice about the content, usually. They don't have any choice about how, how or when they're going to be assessed. Um, they may have very little choice about how they interact with the content. So, um, lecturers may not use things like Blackboard to provide them you know, with the materials the students have then no choice but to go to class to get notes and stuff like that. So teacher-centered approaches are often um, uh, uh, often are, have ten, not all, tend to have limited uh, choice uh, in terms of students, whereas student-centered approaches then would be trying to incorporate more choices so given choosing the student's choice in terms of how they're going to access the material so we tend to see blended learning environments so ones that have kind of rich um uh, things like blackboard to support um the learnings and, and then give students choice well you know i might go to class or i might not depending on what's happening and, and what what learning i'm going to get from it they give students choice maybe about the content and about the ways that they interact with it um, and um, again about the types of assessment and when they're going to happen so it doesn't have to be huge choice but maybe it's you know that instead of having everybody uh, write the same essay for example that there are choices in terms of the topics that students could propose um, to, uh, choices based on their own interests provided they're within the kind of uh, uh, learning outcomes, I guess. Um, sh students are passive versus students are active. Uh, so, so this is, again, students are passive because the lecture is the dominant um, method here. Student-centered learning, there tends to be a much wider range of teaching methodologies used. So lectures may still be used. There's no, we're not uh, suggesting that lectures don't have a role here. But where they are used, um, they tend to be more active and also you tend to see a lot of other, uh, you tend to see a lot of other approaches being used as well. Uh, and interestingly, then you've got power as well as one of the dimensions that, that that's often associated or used to differentiate them. So uh, in teacher-centered approach, the power is always with the teacher. Uh, whereas with student-centered, we're trying to, I guess, divert and divert some of that to the students and, and empower students um, to make the types of choices uh, and to take then responsibility for the choices that they've made so if they choose not to come to class then maybe there's a consequence of that and, and they need to be ready to accept that consequence. Um, so, so, so I guess with maybe those in mind uh, then earlier on, the, 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 this paper talks about, you know, the, some of the literature, uh, which kind of looks at maybe a, a more compre a more comprehensive de definition or um, different tenets of um, student-centered learning. So again, we see some kind of some of the things they've talked about: the reliance of, on active rather than passive learning. An emphasis on deep learning and understanding, increased responsibility and accountability, increased senses of autonomy, um, the, the relationship between the teacher and learner is one of kind of interdependence, uh, you know, kind of partnership approaches. Uh, it has, there has to be respect there. Uh, it has to be built on respect, otherwise it's not going to work. And, and reflection often forms, you know, a kind of uh, a key feature in, in often maybe the assessment or, or the learning process is there on, on again on both counts uh, on both parts. Um, 
so so kind of going away from the high level then what what does a curriculum look like curriculums are are, are centered on the things that we do the learning outcomes are, are always associated with student-centered approaches because the focus then is on what the student will be able to do rather than um maybe 10 years ago um it was on co the focus was exclusively on on course content um as i said then the implications for teaching it's not that a lecture is not appropriate um it may well be but within the lecture then there tends to be you know a range of active learning sort of methods so the recognition that uh you know learning is something that that individuals need to construct by doing things um and, and again, the objective of these sorts of activities is not about entertaining students or even just keeping them engaged. It's really the primary purpose, is if I scroll back uh, up, up to the document, is about two, deep learning. So how do we go about ensuring that, sh that students uh, actually understand you know, the material that we're presenting and, and uh, I guess more, a lot of the literature would be um, coming heavily on the, on, on the side of active learning from that perspective that getting students to engage with the material to do something um, is one of the ways in which, you know, they, they develop understanding, particularly around, you know, discussions and, and um, problem solving and things like that. But outside of the lecture, then you do tend to see a lot of other types of activities going on as well. You know, projects and particularly group projects and uh, and things like that would be um, very typical of student-centered approaches. Um, in terms of the assessment, you know, examples of student-centered assessments, you can again see the, you know the absence of exams here. It's not you know something that would be characteristic of it. No, they may form a part, but they wouldn't be the dominant assessment method. So you, often you're going to see, you know, kind of reflective pieces around diaries, logs and journals in terms of the learning and the learning process, portfolios where, you know, again, portfolios allow students to take responsibility for selecting evidence that's going to demonstrate achievement of learning outcomes. So, you know, there's a lot of onus going back on students to make choices about uh, what is what is the learning outcome to them, uh, what does it mean to them, and, and it's not being dictated to, they're not being dictated to by the lecturer. Uh, um, and and so projects and group work and, and, and things like that, skills and competences would all form, you know, um, very um, common ways of, of going about doing the assessment. Um, but aside from, I guess, the different ways in which this they submit, if you like, or the different artifacts that are used to present the, uh, the, the work, there tends to be uh, a focus on the assessment process as well and involving students in that. So they may, you know, they may have choice in terms of the assessment tasks, uh, and, and how the task is set up in defining, you know, the, the criteria that's going to be used to grade the task, uh, and setting some of that assessment criteria. Uh, self and peer assessment is often used. And in this context, it's not about, it's not necessarily about grading themselves or students, but it's about, you know, here's the criteria that we're going to use. How well do you think your own assignment met that criteria? So it's kind of more of a reflective or discuss, discursive thing rather than something about, uh, rather than uh, assigning a grade. And likewise, the peer assessment piece is not about assessing their peers. It's often about providing feedback comments to their peers. You know, what, what was done really well and maybe what are the aspects that could be improved and, did it meet all the criteria, or were some of them obviously lacking, and things like that? So it's it's about it's about that process rather than the actual um, marks. Even though, like here, they do talk about marks. In my experience, and um, that's uh, much less uh, frequently used than um, involving students in, in um, making comments and and providing feedback on on the work. 
Um, so I guess what I guess what we're trying to do is is just give you an, an idea of um, what student-centered learning is about, uh, and when you're thinking about this or reflecting on this, you do need to keep your own context in mind. So uh, if you have final year students in a small group, then it's going to be a lot easier to do some of these things. It's a lot easier to set up projects. It's a lot easier to give students choice. Um, it's a lot easier to be flexible. It's a lot easier to involve them in assessment and things like that because they have experience, they're older, they're more mature, and you have a smaller group, so it's much, much easier to handle. If you have 200 first years, you know, then that's a very different context. So, you know, when I guess when these things are suggested, student-centered learning, um, the context in which you teach uh, must be part of that conversation or should be part of that conversation or it influences the decisions that you can make. So there's an, it's, it's not intended to suggest that, you know, that student-centered learning is a very fixed idea. There's a whole range of ways in which um, teaching can become more student-centered. And it's really about, you know, uh, maybe do all of those ideas uh, sit well with you? Do you agree with all of those things? With, with the sorts of suggestions that are made in this paper, for example, uh, are they appropriate to your teaching context? Uh, and, you know, what are the sorts of things that you're doing? And maybe what are the sorts of things that are interesting there that would be worth exploring, which is part of, you know, the, the planning for the, for your, your own professional development, you know, where, where could you move to? Um, so I hope it's been useful for you and, um, thanks for listening.